Hi all. I'm going to talk to you about Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, this is going to be like a lot less formal because I'm thinking that's kind of a town hall vibe. If I'm wrong about that, this won't be the first time that I was a lot less formal than something that was supposed to be pretty formal. In fact, I am slowly walking on my treadmill while hydrating. Now it's not coffee. Um, this one's coffee because I'm getting ready to go to Electric Daisy Carnival, which I'm really excited about. Uh, but I am definitely not in shape for that. So, yeah. So, who am I? Um, my pronouns are she or her. I am on the Spark PMC, but I want to be clear that while I am on the Spark PMC, I'm not necessarily talking on behalf of uh, the Spark project, right? These are all my own opinions. Um, I've been around, I've been at a lot of different companies. I'm going to talk about sort of experiences, not just from Netflix, but also at these other companies. I'm also a co-author of a few different books about Spark and related data processing tools. And I also do live streams of open source. If you're looking for something to fall asleep to and you like the sound of someone swearing at a computer. Um, I also got paged like a bunch, uh, but we'll go into that later. Um, and yeah, uh, with that stunning intro, my organization, I don't run it to be clear, right? Like I work in this organization, but they are hiring at Netflix. So if you're interested in doing data engineering um, or, you know, making data engineering tools better at scale, uh, we're hiring and, you know, check out, check out the jobs. Uh, so I, in addition to who I am professionally outside of work, I'm trans, queer, Canadian, and in the broader leather community. Uh, for those of you in America, uh, Pride Month is coming up, and so that's an opportunity to, you know, maybe get involved with, you know, your local community if that's something that you care about. But also, I think just as people who are building data-powered tools, um, and a lot of those tools are now being used to train machine learning models, it's important for us to have diverse communities building these tools and building the models with these tools. And part of that means talking about where we're all from and realizing if we are all from the same place, that is not good. It is time to make the table larger. It's almost always time to make the table larger, but especially when you realize, you know, everyone went to UC Berkeley, uh, class of 09. Um, just an example, I have not been to UC Berkeley. Well, I went to a concert there, but they don't give out degrees for that. So what are some of my possibly relevant biases? So some things to keep in mind. Uh, my advice is going to come from the perspective of someone who's used to working with really large scale data sets. Um, I've worked on Spark for a really long time. And so I think that, excuse my view, um, I don't come from a Kubernetes background, right? I, I come from a Spark on Yarn background and then shifting into running Spark on Kubernetes. Um, I've contributed code to other tools. Um, I really like strongly typed systems. I think they're kind of cool. I don't really love YAML. Um, that, yeah, yeah. Um, I think functional programming is pretty cool. Um, and I've worked on, on some other tools that I sort of gave up working on pretty quickly as well. And I also think my dog is really awesome. That one is probably not going to impact us too much unless he decides to come up and join us. Uh, but in the last practice recording, he did not. So I think we can say he's probably not going to come up and join us. And yeah, um, as an aside, my voice probably sounds a little rougher today than, than I would want. Uh, but I did get paged like twice in the last 24 hours, I think. And so my sleep is not ideal. Uh, and so I am sleepy like the professor. Um, to be clear, the professor is the name of my dog. He is amazing. Okay, cool. So running Spark on Cube. Um, so I want to be clear, I'm going to talk a lot about sort of the experiences of migrating Spark to Cube. Um, and this is because I believe that a lot of people who are looking at running Spark on Kubernetes are probably already running Spark somewhere else, right? If you're new to the Spark project, that's wonderful. I'm super glad you're here. This is really great. Y your life is going to be a little bit easier. Um, and as we, as we switch cluster managers, though, for those of us who have existing working jobs, we may not remember all of the context around those jobs, and then we have to move them 
and then we have to relearn a lot of this context and that can be a little bit frustrating um, and yeah so that's that's one sort of aspect of this I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, spark at, at sort of a smaller scale um, implicitly I, I run spark on k3s on a sketchy rack in Fremont California if anyone's looking for a low-cost IP transit in Hurricane Electric Fremont 2, uh, give me a shout. I realize there are probably all of about six people looking for that, uh, so you are probably not one of them, but you never know. Um, here I am working on that very sketchy rack uh, the other night. I believe I was flashing new bootloaders onto the NVIDIA Jetson AGXs so that I could install a modern version of Linux, so that I could install a modern version of CUDA, so that I could do uh, something with Spark on CUDA on Kubernetes. Uh, so it's turtles all the way down, um, and eventually you end up with someone in a data center pressing some buttons. The other thing that I, I sort of have some experience with that we'll talk about briefly is running Dask on Cube and Ray on Cube. I do those only in my free time. I don't do that for work. Um, we do run Ray at at Netflix, but we run it on a different system that is is not our our Kubernetes sort of inspired one. So let's talk about some best practices for running Spark on Kubernetes. Um, the first one is blob storage. I like to think of blob storage as like a swimming pool. Also, it gives me an excuse uh, to share a picture from Mermaid School, uh, which I managed to trick one of my employers into paying for uh, with the uh, educational reimbursement. Uh, so that was fun. But OK, more seriously, um, this is really important because for people who have been in the Spark on Yarn world, we have HDFS. HDFS is amazing, um, but as we come to Spark on Cube, that's not going to be there for the most part. Uh, and so we need to look at using blob storage. We could also look at using, you know, uh, some of the other wonderful Kubernetes storage APIs. I do not think for the most part they're really well suited to us. Um, I think blob storage and is really the way to go for, for our systems here. Um, one of the patterns that I've seen be relatively successful is shadow writes, so where we are not blocking on our writes to blob storage, um, but we're sort of doing a delayed write back uh, in a non-blocking fashion. The other one is uh, only doing this for files of a certain size. Um, if we've got tons of little tiny small files, that's probably fine to store in like a cube, empty, empty dir, um, some local storage, right? But these these really large files we might start to run out of disk on a local node uh, or at least out of out of our uh, available disk um, another one is decommissioning um, and so decommissioning is a bit of a strange concept especially for people coming from spark on yarn i like to think of it as like what your nighttime routine is right like you go to the really fancy mcdonald's you pick up a nighttime snack you know some french fries you come home you brush your teeth uh, and you go to sleep. Um, I, I didn't have a picture of, of me brushing my teeth, so I got the McDonald's one up there. Um, but it's very similar for, for Spark. Um, we want to let the executors know that like, hey, it's time to start cleaning up, right? It's time to put away the toys that you took out so that another executor can go and find the toys or files uh, when we need them. The other one is, right, um, Spark and Dask and Ray all suffer from this problem of while we can handle the loss of individual executors, we cannot handle the loss of the driver. Um, different different words for driver and the different ones, but essentially the main client driver thing. That abstract sort of concept, we cannot lose it. We do not really have functioning high availability. Um, and in those cases, we need to just set really high priority and hope. Um, also, incidentally, uh, this is this is really useful and important here is to set up the ownership links between the driver and the dependent resources, because if the driver fails or goes away, uh, we want to clean up those dependent resources quickly so they can be made available to another program. 
Uh, one of the other things that I think were is a best practice for the future, that is something that we don't do yet, but I think we could do in the future, would be expressing dynamic priorities. Uh, and so not every executor has the same cost to lose. Uh, and I think it would be really good if we could more dynamically express uh, the disruption cost of the different pods. Unfortunately, we don't really have a good way to do that right now. Um, and so that's, that's a future thing. Uh, I hope we get there someday. Another best practice is putting the driver in the cluster. Now, to be clear, unfortunately, there are some situations under which you cannot do this, right? You, you do need to run in client mode or have a remote connection or whatever sort of different terminology or different tool uses. But in general, right, much like having Professor Timbit in the chair, things are better when they're together, right? If they're separate, if there's a problem with Professor Timbit getting what he needs from the chair, that can block all of our operations. And in fact, in Spark, Dask, and Ray, if there's problems with the driver, it can cause the entire job to fail, right? And so communication with the driver is super important, um, and it's, it's really good to have it be in the same cluster. Now, if you can't do that, right, um, the alternative is to have it in the same cloud or availability region, right, uh, if this is possible. Um, if not, good luck. You'll probably run into network issues that cause your job to fail, but you can restart it. It's, it's not the end of the world. Another sort of interesting best practice that is different between the tools is whether you should deploy directly or with an operator. Um, and now, best practice here is a little fuzzy. Ray and Dask recommend using the operators to deploy. Uh, Spark, on the other hand, does not. If we if we look at how to deploy Spark, running Spark on Kubernetes, the documentation is very much focused on using Spark itself to deploy uh, on Kubernetes rather than using an operator. There are, of course, operators that you can use, and it'll be interesting to see if Spark shifts over time. But for now, the recommended path is sort of the direct or non-operator approach. Another sort of pattern, and this, you know, if you're lucky, you've probably never had to think about this, is I do not think you should share your Dask, Ray, or Spark clusters. Um, I think it's totally fine to share your cube cluster. Uh, but while these tools do have different ideas of multi-tenancy to, to some degree, the level of isolation that they provide is really not ideal. And multiple applications in the same cluster is I consider an anti-pattern. Um, I've never seen it go particularly well. You may, of course, have different experiences, um, but I think that Kubernetes provides us with a sufficient level of resource sharing that we're better off just using Kubernetes to do our resource sharing and depending on dynamic allocation to give back resources that we're no longer using. This is one of these future things. Um, it's it's only somewhat of a future thing in that we're actually working on it, whereas the other thing that I mentioned that was a future thing is like, uh, I should work on this one day. Um, so one of the things that I think we should do is automatic config rewrites. Um, and this is going to lead into the next point where we talk about uh, using historical information. But I think that there's a bunch of new settings that we need to specify in Spark on Cube that we don't have to specify in Spark on Yarn. And I think we should try and automatically set them for the user based on either historical information about previous runs of the job or sort of inferring it from templates. Um, I think this makes a lot of sense also for upgrading or migrating jobs where we might want to automatically set legacy flags on old jobs that we're running with newer systems. but you know, newly created jobs, we don't want to set those same legacy flags. One of the places where I think this really comes into play is previously shared resources, uh, right? So we can think of, uh, you know, maybe Professor Timbit just implicitly shared this raft with whoever was around, but now we actually have like a resource allocation process and you have to like actually request uh, the little floaty thing. Um, more accurately, it, 
you're more likely to encounter this around disk space rather than little floaty objects in a lake or a river on Kubernetes. Um, and what this comes down to is that in some situations, most of the apps will have just been just fine. Everything will just work when you move them over, but there will be a few that were depending on this local shared disk resource, and they're going to fail. Um, now, there's a few different things that we could do here, right? One is we could like make it the responsibility of the user to deal with that. They're probably not going to be super stoked about it. The other is we can detect the failure, and we actually have a bunch of really cool tools to detect and classify failures. And if we detect this failure during, say, an automatic migration, uh, we could increase the amount of disk that that job is asking for. We could also, in theory, look at historical information, but uh, on Yarn, we don't have any built-in good graphs of what local disk space is being used by the different processes. So you'd have to write your own sort of tool around that. Another thing that's super important uh, that we need to do is automatic validation. Uh, it's, it's just not optional anymore. Um, so there's, there's different kinds of validation, right? There's correctness validation, which is super important. But if you're moving from like yarn to cube, you're probably not going to run into correctness issues, although you might, right? Like um, one, one situation where you could definitely run into correctness issues is with like a Python virtual environment where the versions change and now you're actually getting completely different results out and you break recommendations, right? Um, and to a certain degree, right, like correctness testing is a little bit easier, right? We can compare the tables that are output by these different jobs if they're tables, and I've got some tools to do that. Um, but performance is fuzzier. Um, and this is because there's huge variance in terms of Spark jobs and how they run, especially because we're running in shared environments in both situations. And so I think, unfortunately, the automatic validation of performance is really complicated and you'll have to run many iterations of the same job. Uh, you, you, they don't have to be throwaway runs, right? Like they can be actual production runs, but you, you compare historical averages and deviations with the new uh, average and deviation on yarn versus cube. And that's something where we need a little bit more tooling, but there's there's some fantastic folks working on it right now. Another best practice is to use resource profiles, right? Um, regardless, you know, ESP32 probably can't be scheduled to queue, but like, you know, do we want to run on a tiny little machine? Do we want to run on like maybe one of these machines? Maybe we want one of the GPU machines. Maybe we're okay with running on the really weird kind of janky machine that I got from eBay. Actually, most of these machines are from eBay. They're, they're my personal project. But like, maybe we're okay running with like a few gigs of memory. Um, and so it's important to use resource profiles in Spark because through those resource profiles, you can tell Cube like, hey, this task, it really doesn't need a lot of resources. And in doing that, you can save a lot of money, especially if you are running in the cloud, uh, the furthest to the right example. Um, but even if you're running like on-prem, or in my case, on my little Brack down in Fremont, uh, you know, having these resource profiles will help you make more efficient use of your cluster. OK, that's really all that I have. Um, I hope this was interesting. Uh, if you find these kinds of problems fun, if you want to like work on making tooling to automate migrations from legacy clusters to new clusters, or if you're just interested in making data tools scale, uh, the data organization is hiring at Netflix, and I hope you will consider applying. Um, and yeah, have a lovely rest of your day. Hell yeah. Have a good one.